I think we're here. Hey, Joel. Hey, Selena. Hey. <laughs> hey, Sophia. Hi. <laughs> Great. And I think, yeah, we're already with everyone here. Hi, everyone. If you can hear us and see us. Good to be here. So we're just giving it a couple of minutes to get started. So uh, if you are willing and able, feel free to put on the Zoom chat where you are coming in from, where are you calling from? And have you ever played any musical instrument or a sport? Okay, so where you're from, musical instrument or sport? It will be relevant very obviously in a minute. Oh, Mitch plays jazz trumpet. Love it. I was just reading Miles Davis's autobiography the other day. Great. Indianapolis, Canada, London. Piano, violin, and drums. Wow. One man band. Mafia. Great. Dancer. Wonderful. Philippines volleyball. I see a lot of talent on our Zoom chat today. We could make a band here. We could make a band. We could make a whole circus. <laughs> While we're... Hey, Jordan. Good to see you, man. So, Jordan, as we know, we're doing our usual spiel, asking people where they're from on the Zoom chat, any musical instruments or um, sports they do. Are you asking me? Uh, no, no, I'm just saying no, just that the, the just Zoom in the, chat. Yeah, doing... like, oh, no, yeah. Jordan, do you no. play any music? <laughs> no? <laughs> no, we're not. We're not all Alex. Alex Voss. <laughs> well, you're you're focusing on your the little practice on psychotherapy. It's very laudable of you. <laughs> Thank you. It's good to see the rest of you again. I haven't seen most of you in years. It's crazy. Yeah, you do this high intensity work, right? And then <laughs> great. We'll do, give it just one more minute. Thank you, everyone, for keep writing on the chat. My God, we have an international crowd, lots of talents. Fantastic. And we're all here as well. Nigeria play drums. Great. Singing. Nigeria. Wow. SoCal, great. Right. So, yeah, lots of talent here. I think we can go ahead and get started. How you guys feel up to it? Let's do it. All right. Let me share my screen here. Let's get started. So... Welcome everyone to this wonderful webinar on Deliver Practice for Multicultural Therapy. My name is Alex Vash, and I am very, very happy to be joined by my four amazing, wonderful, <laughs> hyper-talented co-authors, and I should say lead authors of this book on Deliver Practice for Multicultural Therapy. Usually I would be doing the presentations on uh, our lead experts, but because there are so many today, I think it's much nicer to hear from them. So I'm actually going to pass the ball if that's okay. And we can go kind of stepwise fashion. Maybe if it's okay, I'll start with Jordan. Jordan, could you give us just a brief intro on who you are, where you're from? Yes, uh, Dr. Jordan Harris. Got a, a PhD in marriage and family therapy, currently living in Arkansas, but I'm from Baltimore, Maryland. So if anybody uh, is a big Ravens fan out there, put a shout out. <laughs> um, yeah, and was happy and very, very pleased to be asked to be on this book, which I'm very proud of. Got to work with this great team, and it was a lot of fun. And um, yeah, that's 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 me, and that's what I do. Uh, currently, I'm in private practice and also working in, with Cintio on different projects. So yeah, that's I should me. also mention that Jordan is a very talented deliberate practice supervisor. Thank He's you. too humble to say it, so I'll say it for him. <laughs> Thank you, Alex. Great. And Joel? Hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Joel Chin. I'm living right now in Seattle, but originally from Toronto, Canada. And my PhD is in clinical psychology. I was in grad school in Southern California. Um, so been around a little bit. So <laughs> grateful to be here with this group as well. It was such a fun project to be part of. Thank you, Joel. Sophia? Hi, I'm Dr. Sophia Hoffman. I am calling in from Brooklyn, also from New York. 
I'm the director of clinical training at the FERCOF uh, School Clinical Combined PsyD program, um, where I teach our multiculturalism sequence of classes, um, one of which is required, two of which I wish were required. <laughs> um, and as well, I am in private practice seeing actually a folks across the lifespan in Brooklyn. Thank you, Sophia. And Selena, last but not least. Hi everyone, my name is Selena Fan. I am a doctoral candidate at Perkoff Graduate School of Psychology in the School Clinical uh, Combined Side D program. I'm currently in my fifth and final year. I'm currently in psychology intern at Elmhurst Hospital out in New York. And it has been such an honor as a student, as a trainee to be involved in this project. So really excited to be here and really excited to see the global reach of all the participants today. Fantastic. And congratulations, Selena. An APA book under your belt at this stage is really something. <laughs> Thank you. Well, my name is Alex Vaz. I am with the Sentio Marriage and Family Therapy Program and the Sentio Counseling Center. Uh, we are a nonprofit, not for profit uh, counseling center. And also in September, we will start this new master's level program, which to our knowledge is the first program that uh, integrates uh, theory education lectures with deliberate practice throughout the whole program. So if you're interested and want also to check out our free deliberate practice resources, it's all there on the website, sentio.org. And that's my little plug. All right, let's get to the good stuff. So uh, maybe some of you have come to a deliberate practice webinar before. Maybe this is your first one. Welcome all. We always like to start with this very basic distinction, uh, in part because I get so excited about these kind of topics that I could go on for three hours. So I promise to only do this single slide and then quickly throw it to the topic at hand. So let me just make this distinction between conceptual learning or conceptual training and procedural learning or procedural training. So conceptual learning is all sorts of learning that you do, that you do through, through reflection, thinking about things. So for example, let's imagine you want to learn about psychotherapy and multicultural issues. You read about it, you go to lectures, you discuss with peers, you reflect about it. All that is super important <laughs> to become an expert in whatever field, and that is all called conceptual learning, right? If you look back at your training as a psychologist, counselor, et cetera, chances are 95% of your training falls under conceptual training. You read a lot of books, you saw videos of other people doing therapy, you discussed topics, you went to lectures. Again, all very important. However, in the literature, there's a very different type of learning, very different type of training called procedural learning, which increases your procedural knowledge. And that has to do with learning by doing, right? Some of you have noticed I have a bunch of instruments behind me. We asked you before, have you played any musical instrument before or done any sports? The reason is all of those of you who have done any sports or music know that, for example, to become a good pianist, reading books about the piano isn't going to do a lot for you. You actually have to play the piano and get immediate feedback on your performance so you can get better and better over time, right? Same goes for um, sports. Same goes for a lot of medicine, like surgeons, for example. And we would argue same goes for psychotherapy. In other words, what we believe is that psychotherapy to become an expert therapist, you do require a lot of conceptual learning. So we're not throwing that away, but we need a lot of procedural learning as well skill building exercises, like playing the scales on the piano to get better and better over time. And you might have noticed that most training programs have approximately, give or take zero, <laughs> procedural learning. Some a bit more, but in terms of structured skill building, it's actually quite rare. So what we're trying to do with this book series and with this book in particular that we're going to be focusing on is providing you all with skill building deliberate practice exercises so that not only you know the theory of multicultural orientation or multicultural therapy, but actually are able to implement skills in session with real people. Right? End of rant. So 
this is the book series, the APA book series that my colleague Tony Rumaner and I have been editing. And today we're focusing on the book of Deliver Practice in Multicultural Therapy. We have a host of wonderful co-authors. As you may imagine, quite a complex theme to do a book over this. Uh, each of these books have 12 skill building exercises, the little practice exercises for you to practice your scales, let's say, in each topic. And so let's bridge it now to this particular book on the little practice to multi in multicultural therapy. So these are the 12 skill building exercises in the deliberate practice in multicultural therapy book, which you definitely should buy. So you'll notice that there's this kind of uh, colored lines here on the left. We've tried to divide the skills of the lower practice exercises into sort of beginner exercises, intermediate exercises, and harder, more advanced exercises. And first question I want to throw to the group, I honestly don't know because there's four of you where to start, so I'll just let whoever is inspired to start talking, is first of all, I think the obvious question, which is, how did you come up with a system to choose what skills to write about and what skills to focus on? Out of all the potential skills that could be focused on, what was the process like in discussing and coming up with the choice of the skills? Whoever feels inspired to talk about this. Okay, let me start us off. The way that I thought about this is one, of course, there's so much research and literature to go through. And we could spend hours and hours in lecture talking about all the great theorists and research, but just trying to pick what are the core skills that I see that clinicians and researchers keep talking about. And then I also thought about what are the most anxiety provoking clinical experiences for a clinician like myself, but then also as students, like what do I hear from them? Like, oh, it's so hard to do this, or I just don't know what to do when someone says this, or it just pushes my buttons. And so, um, you know, trying to consolidate so much literature and then also thinking about anxiety provoking situations. Those are two factors that I had in mind. Um, I can jump in to say that as we're kind of building out the chapters, I thought a lot about where we start with um, the student when I teach students, which is that the pillars of the cultural humility stance are the um, intrapsychic, the interpersonal, and the systemic. And I tried to think about how we would work through those three necessary pillars of cultural humility in a practice workbook. Um, so I use those as kind of the big uh, kind of the big categories that I thought about as we were all honing how we would approach these chapters, um, which is the cultural humility pillars or on my mind. We're already getting some great questions. Jordan. Yeah, I mean, I would just agree, right? Uh, really looking through Owen's sort of multi um, cultural orientation framework, right? Which basically says that there's cultural humility, cultural comfort, and cultural. I'm going to blank on this now that I'm on the training. Um, humility, comfort, and opportunities. Yeah, right. Immediately, <laughs> you just blank like those. And then, kind of like what Joel was saying, of like, what do I see students, uh, supervisees actually struggling, struggling with? So that's sort of where we did. And then a lot of back and forth with mm -hmm. other people who are writing the book because we all have different experiences. And Jordan blanking yeah. out is actually a great uh, example of uh, pressure, right? Performance under pressure, right? It's easy to remember doing skills when you're outside a session, in the session harder. <laughs> Selena. Yeah, I'll just add it to just also add the student and training perspective of like what is most anxiety provoking and thinking about like, you know, what what kind of workbook would be helpful for me to use or for future students to use. Um, and it was definitely a hard process, but collaborative process in trying to hone it down to 12 skills. Uh, yeah. So looking through these skills, there is something that seems particularly interesting about this particular book is that there are definitely what you may call interpersonal skills, like the therapist in you know doing some sort of uh, interpersonal skill towards the client. But it seems that a lot of these skills also have to do with some sort of inner work for the therapist. 
And I would love it if you could comment on this, on the importance of doing experiential skill building, touching on the person of the therapist. Why would that be important? Hmm. Yeah, when I give trainings on this, I generally say like issues of identity are always connected to issues of pain. And this is for um, our clients, but also for ourselves. And so we really have to be aware of what we're feeling and what is coming up for us in these moments. Um, and part of that is doing the exercise, right? I mean, I think if you've ever done any deliberate practice, the doing of the exercise can bring up anxiety for us. And then also part of that is, is, you know, we, we often encourage people after you do the exercise to self reflect back to balancing out the procedural with the conceptual. And so, um, that's also a part of the deliberate practice of, okay, where are my own biases, my own hangups, my own pushbacks, my own discomforts coming up here. So I can be aware of those as I'm working with the, with this client. I totally agree with that, um, Jordan. And I would also say that, you know, coming back to this idea of, you know, I think we're all to some extent have been teachers of some of these in part. And so I thought a lot about, and I think we all thought a lot about the ways that students are asked to think about who they are in the room first and foremost and what they're bringing to the work. And, you know, I found as I'm sure we all have that students have different awareness and sense of awareness of themselves in the room when they first are learning. And so thinking through how to ask them to show up to that question was I think an important part of how we structured the sequencing of the book as well. Yeah, and I think building off of that, um, these relational interpersonal skills within multicultural therapy they're personally challenging because there's there are ways of relating to someone else. And so I might have never interacted with someone from this background or identity, or I might have in my personal life, but as a clinician, as a psychotherapist, there's a different way to be and to relate. And so it just, it, it catches me off guard. I feel anxious about it sometimes. And so that's why I need a little bit more practice. And eventually that leads to great discussions of, well, what might this mean? But it's oftentimes the practice and the experience and the exposure that kind of activates these great thoughts of, oh, like now I have to talk about this with my supervisor or read this next book. Yeah, kind of what I'm hearing from you is also, it's one thing to read about, let's imagine cultural humility, quite a different thing to actually be able to own it and, and be it and showcasing it in a, in a real situation, right? So I'm kind of curious because we're going to demonstrate, or we're going to show everyone an example of one of the little practice exercises that you came up with. Before we do that, just one last question for the group. Um, did you have experiments in trying out the exercises, either yourself or with your trainees? And how was that informative of the whole writing of this book? Or what did you learn from testing these exercises? Yeah, I mean, we tested these. We, I mean, part of the, I feel like the whole process was sort of meta in the sense of like as we're like doing deliberate practice exercises and creating them we're testing them out to see if they would actually work right like are people actually able to do what we're asking them to do or are our instructions unclear or you know what's happening um and so yeah i mean we sent these out to supervisors and teachers and had them test with their own um students and watched tape and got feedback and looked at, you know, we did all that sort of stuff to see if it actually was conveying the intent. And oftentimes, like I know me and Joel had several skills that were actually at like the same thing. So we had to cut, you know, versions of those skills. And um, so, yeah, it was just this iterative back and forth sort of process of constantly refining and refining and refining. Anyone else have thoughts on the experiments or testing the exercises? Yeah, well, I think it's 
it, it's such a vulnerable position to write something that you thought so hard of and collaborated and then you send it out into the world and people are testing it and you're watching the recordings of that and you realize oh I'm not as clear as I thought I was <laughs> or wow they really enjoyed that experience or wow that was a really hard skill I thought that was a intermediate skill or whatever that might be and so that feedback from people who actually experience the exercises was so helpful for us as authors um, and just me as a teacher and as a clinician as well of um, realizing, okay, uh, how do I really break down multicultural therapy? And what am I trying to communicate to people? And then what's the feedback that they give back? They, it's so mutual and it's so reciprocal. I'm curious, Selena, because maybe you're closer to the experience of a lot of people who are going to go through these exercises. Any kind of thoughts on not just writing of it, but actually trying it out either yourself or with other people, the exercises? Yeah, I um, kind of what Joel had mentioned, I think um, scaffolding the statements and the level of difficulty was particularly challenging. And um, something I noticed like in my process of coming up with examples is that, you know, sometimes focusing on one aspect of identity was kind of like the core of each state, like state, like example, but something that I also thought of and which I think was important for the purpose of scaffolding them as students are like practicing and learning these skills. Um, but, you know, an afterthought that I had is Obviously, our clients, you know, people are complex, there's multiple identities, there are intersectional identities. And so I think that that's, um, you know, something to consider in like future work and is important to just hold in mind as well. Yeah, I, I'm also I'm not sure if other people had other folks had this experience, but um, when I do pieces of deliberate practice or deliberate practice in courses, I'm present. <laughs> And the I, it was a big lift um, for me as I was writing to think through and to notice how things change when it's on paper with other people guiding through it, which I think is something I know we talked about is really thinking through how to release and, you know, let it have it uh, be written in a way that I felt like was conveying what we were trying to really bring across, which I think had trial and error to it as well, at least for me in my process. So these are not first drafts, everyone, just no. so you know. <laughs> and I will say, I mean, I've been involved now with almost, I, I think it's 21 Dolor practice books. And out of all of those, this particular one, I mean, of course, all of them have all their challenges. But one great thing and challenging thing about the, the exercises you put together is that for a lot of people, for a lot of different reasons, the process of training can be quite triggering hopefully in the best way possible. <laughs> Although fortunately, we also have a system within the book to make sure you're in that zone of proximal development. But be wary that this is not easy. This pulls out a lot of your own complex feelings, your own developmental background, and just be gentle with yourselves if you are going to do these exercises. Great. So because we're believers of actually, you know, uh, showing, not just telling, how about we actually show a little practice exercise and we had considered which one we could focus on out of all the ones that we have here. It goes everything from assessing client expectations, inquiring about identity, cultural implications of the client's problem, everything, right? So today we're going to demonstrate just one exercise with you all, and we're focusing on the skill of acknowledging therapist limitations. I would call this a modern classic already. <laughs> So I so the way this works in our Dolor practice exercises is we try to deconstruct what often is somewhat of a vague skill or term into very actionable uh, training principles, so what we call skill criteria. And for this exercise of acknowledging therapist limitations, we have two skill criteria, two things that the therapist is trying to do and trying to get better at throughout training. So for this exercise, the criteria are for the therapist to self-disclose on their limitations in terms of their ability to understand the client's experience. So the therapist is just being very honest and disclosing that they have some limitation in their ability to understand the client's experience. 
Second, the therapist should ask a question to further explore the client's background. Before we go further, I'd love to ask you guys, why this skill? Why is this relevant? And what's kind of the challenge inherent to doing this skill effectively? I can jump in. Yeah. Um, I think this relates to what we were um, touching on when it comes to doing the inner work as well and acknowledging the therapist's limitations within the therapeutic relationship is important um, because that's also related to that, that inner work of knowing um, what your limits are and then also not expecting or placing it on clients to then educate or inform us about their own cultural background. And then it also gives room and opportunity to have the explore conversations around that and uh, open up that door. I thought this skill was really useful uh, and really important. I think because I've seen uh, what I'll call like a cultural gap in both directions. Like I've seen a gap between me and other people who I, I don't share an identity with and I want to understand their experience. I've also seen it the other way where clients will oftentimes assume, oh, because you live here or you look like me, that we do have the same experience. And sometimes we don't, right? And so I think um, instead of pretending like I do, you know, uh, being open about that, but doing it in a way that actually creates more of a conversation and shutting the conversation down is really important. So for me, that's why the skill was like, when I first, I forget who wrote this one, but when I first saw the skill, I was like, oh, this is a really good, useful skill. Well, on the one hand, the client might really need to hear this, right? From a relational perspective, understand that the client does have their limitations. On the therapist end, I would imagine it might be difficult sometimes to assume that limitation. There might be some shame involved for the therapist, and it's not easy to assume our limitations often. Sophia? I like this skill also because I think that it acknowledges something that's already in the room that's true, which is that sometimes the therapist is not going to know something and it teaches students how to figure out how to move through that with the acknowledging shame or reducing shame because it's actually speaking a truth in, in a lot of cases when you're doing therapy at, at the intersection of different identities. Um, and you know it moves away from that uh, competency language um, that you can know all you need to know and towards the practice building. So. You know, I think this one is nice when you see students click into it because it's, yeah, it's already in there. <laughs> it's already in the room. If you don't know something, it's already in the room. And how do you bring it well? I think that's so true. And I've seen that, I see, I've seen a different variation of that as well. Of mm -hmm. I've definitely had clients and I've seen tape of uh, clients and supervisees where uh, they both know it. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking particularly of like white clients I've seen working with black clients mm -hmm. and the white client saying you have a different experience actually decreases anxiety mm -hmm. for the black clients, right? Mm -hmm. and so, I mean, again, like there's so many different nuances, I think, to how this skill can really be useful mm -hmm. because it's in the room, right? Like if you think your client isn't thinking that, <laughs> um, you're probably wrong. You're probably wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. So helping us uh, be more comfortable with reality in a way. <laughs> Great. So why don't we show an example of this skill in action? So all these skills are mini role-playing exercises. It's not traditional role-play in the sense that there's not an ongoing conversation between two trainees playing the client and therapist. It's very isolated. You know, one person says a client statement. And the therapist tries to improvise a response that meets these criteria. So just as a way of example, let's, exa uh, let's uh, imagine that the client's statement is this. Client says, finally, 
I can work with a therapist who know what it's like. I want to work with someone who understands being raised by parents like mine, right? So here, back to Jordan's example, the client is assuming, <laughs> right, bless their hearts, that the therapist will, of course, understand what it was like to be raised by parents like the clients. Therapist could answer first, to meet the first criteria, therapist could say, I'm glad we're able to work together too. I may not understand exactly what your parents were like, even though we might share similarities. So this fulfills criterion one. This is therapists self-disclosing their limitations in their ability to understand the client's experience. Second, therapist says, what was it like growing up with your parents? And this fulfills criteria two, asking a question to further explore the client's cultural background. So this is one example. What's cool about the lower practice is that you could meet these two criteria with many, many different words in different ways, right? So we're trying to help you practice to meet these criteria, these principles, not really in a road fashion, just do the same words again and again, right? So uh, we thought we could do something hopefully fun and interesting. Is anyone who uh, wants to do it, we're going to provide a new client statement and would invite attendees of this webinar to write on the Zoom chat a response, improvise a therapist response that you think would meet the skill criteria. And as luck would have it, we have our four lead offers here that can provide feedback on your response. So let me just read this new client statement. So client says, I'm so excited to work with someone who specializes in LGBTQ plus issues. You've probably heard it all at this point. So imagine your client says this. Try writing on the Zoom chat a response that meets the two skill criteria. We'll give everyone a minute. Right, we're starting to get our first uh, responses here. I'm gonna read a response out loud and I'll just ask Joel, Jordan, Sophia, Selena to give feedback on this. Let me just read one of these. I'm glad to be able to offer you some support. However, I don't think anyone has heard it all. Everyone's experiences are so different. What are the LGBTQ plus issues you have had? Co-offers, how would you rate this response? I like it. I think this is from Angela. Is this right? Correct. Um, first part, I'm glad to be able to support, to offer you some support. However, I don't think anyone has heard it all. You know, this is touching on criterion one. And um, I, you know, I might even push to say that you can make it more personal to disclose that you haven't heard it. Like I haven't heard it all, not mm -hmm. just anyone. Um, and then the second part, yeah, it, it touches right on the criteria number two. Um, what are the LGBTQ plus issues you have had? So you ask the question to further explore the client's background. So, um, you know, if we had a repeat, I would say, you know, keep much of this the same. Try to add a bit more self personal self disclosure, and I think you'll hit both criteria. I want to give just a meta comment to what Joel just did there, because you've noticed that the, the response that we just read largely fulfills the criteria. In deliberate practice, the opportunity we have is to be real nitpickers. We can tweak very small wordings to make it just a little bit more refined. Just like if you were playing a musical scale, you can do it just a little bit different to get a little bit better. That was great, Joel. Let's uh, read another one. So I'm going to... Thank you all for 
for all the I'm gonna go to the last one from Elizabeth here. So Elizabeth says, I'm happy that our paths have crossed too. I will do my best to understand your specific situation and hear what you have to say. What in relation to LGBTQ plus would you like to discuss today? Feedback on this one. I'll jump in. Um, so, and Elizabeth, I think, has even sort of broke this down, right? So her first statement, or their first statement, I am happy with our, I'm happy that our paths cross too. I'll do my best to understand your specific situations and hear what you have to say. I would actually ask uh, this person to be more specific in disclosing their limitations. I think that they're very close, but <clears throat> if you were even to say like, um, I, I, I will do my best because I don't know all the things that have happened for you, or I don't know all the things that might relate specifically to your situation. Right. Um, and then for skill criteria two, what in relation to LGBTQ plus would you like to discuss today? I actually like that. What in relation would you like to discuss today? You might make that kind of like Joel was saying a little bit more personal. What specifically for you around this do I need to know? Um, but I still think it's a pretty strong second criteria match. So my overall feedback would be, for skill criteria one, be more specific about your specific limitations. And would it be fair to say, Jordan, this is one of the hardest part of this exercise is being actually pretty explicit, pretty upfront about one's own limitations? I think so, you know, and part of that I think is human. Maybe it's just me, but I don't like saying that I, I don't know. <laughs> I'm making my job to know a lot of the time, you know. Um, but I think it's I think it's also good modeling, right? Because we're both going to be curious as we're trying to help you, client, figure out how to help yourself. So, right. Wonderful. And I, I want to also tell everyone, uh, today we're doing this in written format. So the attendees are writing this on the Zoom chat. In a real deliver practice exercise, we do it even a step further where we do this in a role play fashion, which is even harder, right? Now it has questions of intonation and we usually are not as verbally fluent when we talk than when we're writing. So yeah, quite a hard skill. Why don't we try a different client statement? Oh, by the way, I'll, I'll read a, an example response. Uh, just so everyone knows, all the client statements have also on the book example therapist responses written by the authors. So you can also model from there. So in this particular one, therapist could say, I'm glad you're looking forward to our sessions together. I don't want to assume that I can fully understand your experiences, though. What about your gender and sexual orientation is important to discuss today? So that would be one way out of several to fulfill the criteria. Let's try a different one, different client statement. So in this case, client says, it's hard to share when no one ever understands what it's like to be raised uh, religiously orthodox in a small community. Will you get me? So for all those, thank you so much for last time trying out the, the Zoom chat. If you're available, try replying to this particular client statement. All right, I think we have our first replies here. So I'm just going to read out loud from Matthew here. I cannot claim to have the experience to know what it's like, what that's like, though I hope we can still work together. Can you begin by telling me a little bit more about that experience? Maybe Sophie and Selena, you want to try out some feedback?
I was rereading it. You go for it, Selena. I had to read it again. (laughs) Yeah, I'm going to, I can read it again as well. Um, I cannot claim to have the experience to know what that's like, though I hope we can still work together. So it's all, this example is also very clearly labeled with the the two different criterion. So I think this first one does address in self-disclosing um, limitations in one's ability to understand the client's experience. Um, and then the second point asks, you know, can you begin by telling me a little bit more about that experience? Um, opens up the question to further explore how that um, relates to this client's cultural background. Um, I think that it hits on those two points, but I'm not sure if other folks ha- have um, comments as to how to fine tune if they think that would be appropriate here. The only thing I would say, which I actually think is maybe a trick of the the writing in the chat versus doing it out loud, is that there are ways to say that isn't the experience I had being raised, or that's not, I don't have direct experience with that, and really full stop that as the acknowledging the limitations, and then go into the piece of it that is that warmth, but I'd like to hear more in order to, mm-hmm. you know, help you. So, you know, that even saying, no, I don't have that experience, but I have some experience doing this kind of work, and you know, I'd like to hear some more. So I think there is a trick of the typing out that might be happening, but just as a, you know, just as a note. Yeah, yeah, do great points for you. So of course, doing this again in vivo will flush out even more details that might need to be worked on, right? Let me just read another one. This comes from Michael Rogers. So Michael says, you're really unsure, wait, sorry, I'm going to pull it up. You're really unsure I will understand your experience with religion in a small community. And you are right, I may not. But I would really like to. What what has been difficult about that experience? Any feedback on that one? I think it hits the criteria. I also think it's nice to reflect back the unsure feeling um, that the client is coming with. I also would say very, this is this is again that um, very nitpicky, so forgive me, but um, we also in this, um, you know, deliberate practice and cultural humility space, we leave space for the idea that it might not all have been a difficult experience, that we want to make space for the idea about the breadth of the experience. So that is a very nitpicky thing to say to Michael's response, but I think it's something to keep in mind is that we assume difficulty when someone's bringing it into the room, but we could also say, I want to hear all about what it was like to being raised in a small community, for example. Great. And if I understand you correctly, Sophia, it's about the experience, exploring the experience, not assuming it's a bad, neutral, or good experience. Mm -hmm. Great point. So you can notice, I hope everyone uh, attending, the amount of feedback we can get, even if it's largely positive, which in this case it was, Mm -hmm. the opportunities to refine the intervention, even if it was largely positive. And I think this is part of the the magic or the importance of the little practice is there's always, well, not always, but most cases there's space for improvement. And really the name of the game is repetition and refinement, right? So if we were to do a little practice exercise, we would want to do multiple rounds mm-hmm. where, you know, you didn't just have this first take, you got the feedback from Sophia, Joran, Joel, Selena, and then you try again and you try again until you felt it right in your bones, right? Kind of curious to ask, because we've done two of these, and thank you everyone for trying out your hands in chat. Really appreciate it. Great job. What do you feel could be um, the main challenges in being able to do this skill? Because there seems to be some interpersonal challenges, but also some intra internal challenges that could come out of this. Yeah, um, you're asking us, right? As panelists, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Um, I think there's like there's like this weird paradox. I think when you're doing deliberate practice, where 
the content and also the the practice of it, the doing of it can bring up our own insecurities, right? Whether it's an inner critic or self-judgment or that sort of thing. And I actually think that for most of the practice, and this is my experience, I don't have research for this, actually sticking with the practice is actually the best sort of remedy for that, right? Um, and that's why when we give feedback, we give it based on the skill criteria. And it, uh, what I've seen oftentimes, this isn't always the case, but I've seen oftentimes this, when people struggle because their own stuff is sort of getting uh, triggered in these moments, us being able to give really clear feedback sends the message of, okay, this is what I need to do to succeed. And then if I do this, I've done well. And actually I feel even more empowered to keep doing this skill and to practice and to grow in this area. So of course we need to be monitoring how people are doing and if they're having sort of ab reactions or uh, a lot of self-criticism, but oftentimes the practice itself is, is uh, really empowering for students and trainees. Maybe also for you to Joel. I know Joel, you had a lot of experiences with working trainees. Something that we have found across the whole dealer practice exercise reign that was kind of surprising when we first found out is that a lot of trainees and therapists doing dealer practice actually get less anxious if you give them more corrective feedback. Because some supervisors or some trainers implementing dealer practice might veer towards giving almost always positive feedback, like you did great, you did great. And we saw on the video recordings, if you just give positive feedback, trainees' anxiety goes up. <laughs> but if you're very compassionately clear about what to change, they actually go down in anxiety. Has that been your experience? Can you maybe say a bit about that? Yeah, thanks for leading into that. I, I think that's 100% true that trainees um, or someone who's just new to a way of um, practicing certain types of therapy, they're looking for clear, concrete micro steps to do next. Um, not that they're dependent on that, but they're just looking for, hey, um, I've taken your positive encouragement of what I did well. Now show me what, what's next after that. What could I fine tune? What can I do a little bit better? Not that we can fully arrive um, at some destination ever, but that we trust the process that we're gonna get better and better, more compassionate, more flexible, more comfortable, more open. Um, and that we start to give all these options for students. And I think that does decrease their anxiety because they say, I've seen this a hundred times in my class before I get to this real client. Um, and so I, I think that's the drop. And you really do have to experience it, like Jordan said, like you have to practice this. You can't just read about people's anxieties dropping practice and feel your anxiety dropping over time. Maybe Selena, Sophia, you had any thoughts on this? I was going to say also, I, you know, I think that the practice piece of it, just speaking to what Jordan and Joel just said, um, because of the repetition combined with the directive feedback about it, actually does interesting work of helping students find their own voice. Like you notice students drop into their own voice a little bit more with more repetition. It starts a lot of the time with students or trainees or anybody kind of doing these exercises where they're searching for right and then they drop into authentic with the repetition, which I think is what I find can be really powerful about it in the practice piece of it. Great point. That's kind of what I was just going to to add. And, and when I've had the opportunity to practice this at, and test out some of the different exercises, even from other books with um, peers, um, you know, especially with the, some on a peer level, there's like that comfort and we're able to kind of test out di our different voices into what feels most authentic and in a safe space where you can play around and experiment with that. And, um, you know, I think the, the skill criteria is very helpful, but there's still a lot of room for your own personalization and authenticity to come through. Thank you both. Cause I think one of the concerns and a very valid concern over the little practice is will it make mechanistic training and, and trainees, right? That, that they just repeat the same sentence over and over again. 
And I think in the book, we use the metaphor of jazz improvisation, that to become a master improviser, you have to learn the scales and be able to have those building blocks to then be able to freely improvise, right? Of course, I'm very partial bias towards musical metaphors, <laughs> but others would apply. So we're just about uh, to wrap up. I'm kind of curious if we could go through each of you, Jordan, Sophia, Joel, Selena, any kind of takeaways, words of encouragement or last thoughts and people who are considering uh, doing the work of the Lord of practice? Because in our experience, most people fairly quickly agree theoretically <laughs> with its uh, usefulness, but actually doing it is hard. So what are your words on that? <laughs> yeah, I I come from an athlete back background. Uh, I ran track for a decade. And I think, and so because of that, I think my my encouragement is different than at least what I see my peers saying. Um, and so a lot of my peers, and this is a good message, will say things like, you know, in, in, encouraging things. And my thing is like, just get to the track, like just get to the gym, just, <laughs> right? <laughs> like, like, and I, this is something I see within myself. I mean, in, in numerous areas, when I've done deliberate practice and show tape to people it's like there's this initial anxiety and I, I you know i've had so many experiences of having that anxiety when you first get up to go run or first get up to go work out but as soon as you actually get to the track or get to the gym it gets less anxious and it's actually easier than you thought it was going to be and so my encouragement is if you if this resonates with you and you initially feel this sort of anxiety when you approach doing it that's normal and like, just get to the gym, put on your shoes and, you know, and just, and just, and just do it. So. Yeah. I, I, I loved my basketball team practices. This is when I could make mistakes. This is when I could try out new shots and I would be dribbling and the ball would bounce off my feet because when it was game time, when it was an actual session, I just knew the repetitions that I went through. Now, I'm not a professional athlete, so I didn't practice that much in basketball. But just to say that um, practicing, deliberate practice of psychotherapy, multicultural therapy can be fun. I've had so many laughs with my students, so many great discussions, so much growth exponentially because they're practicing. Uh, it's been amazing, amazing to see. It's so, so, so much fruitful work. And uh, it, it is a collaborative connecting framework. You're not supposed to do this by yourself, or you're not supposed to have the answers by yourself. You're supposed to have a peer, a coach, an expert. And that is a good thing for us as a field. That's a good thing for us as individuals too, so that we don't burn out. Um, I think I echo all of that. And I just want to say, you know, a lot of the time when we talk about doing really excellent intersectional multicultural therapy and we're you know coming to a place of wanting to do that well there's often a question of where to start and I think starting with practice that you can actually really do and take yourself through um is really heartening and I think I feel I didn't I didn't say this at the top and I wish I had but I'm also proud of this book and was honored to be working with the people who worked on it so if you don't know where to start, this is a great place to start to build the skills. To echo what everyone said and to show our little physical copy <laughs> to get this book and try it out. And, you know, if there's anxiety around, you know, taking this, like for students to take this to their supervisors, try it out with a peer, practice, um, have fun with it, play with it, and the anxiety will decrease and drop over time. Oh my God, so much wisdom here. I, I want to publicly again say congratulations to all of you. I mean, this is such an endeavor. I would say an Herculean endeavor to be able to <laughs> do something like this in such a vast field. So congratulations. I hope everyone feels inspired to do some practice. And we, of course, encourage you to get a copy of the book. Uh, 
hopefully, uh, you know, we'll be able to keep doing these. So uh, hopefully you can reach out to any of us if you want further resources. Uh, I put on the Zoom chat if you want access to more videos and webinars on the Lower Practice, feel free to use the Sentia website as well. And yeah, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much for participating. And um, I think that's it. I'm going to give us some silent applause. <laughs> and yeah, good to see you. <laughs> Bye, everyone. <laughs>